It's always not just a pleasure, but a very important moment to be here in a room full of such powerful people. Because as Vinodji mentioned rightly, yeah. it's very important to address a crowd which can take decisions. And all of you as principals are decision makers. And often when we do workshops for school teachers and school counsellors, however convinced they may be, at the end of the workshop, they will always come up and say, Sir, you have told it's all very good, but who will convince my principal? But at the end of the day, it's the principal or the trustees of the school who can take decisions and who have the power to implement. So I'm very glad to have this opportunity. Thank you, Aparisa Asha, for giving me this opportunity. And I'd like to start by just sharing some details of the work we've been able to do. I will not bore you with a long presentation because I don't think we need to get there. The theme of the talks this morning has been on the fact that we've been looking at philosophy. And it's very nice and interesting to talk about philosophy, even nicer to hear about it. But the difficulty I've learned is in trying to implement whatever philosophy you may hear and you may always believe. So the first thing that I'd like to try and do is give some suggestions that you may improvise on, you may reject, you may accept, you may approve, and then let's see if we can try and do it. I think the theme of this morning today has been self-discovery more than anything else. And in all the activities that Paris Rasha has done so far, it's been trying to involve all of us. And what is it that they've been trying to say? Unfortunately, even I did not have a long association with them. It's only when Aarti ma'am and Nurmila ma'am came over last week to kind of have a chat that I really discovered how all of us unfortunately work in silos. All of us are probably doing the same thing, but in our own way, and if we don't connect, there's no transfer of technology. And if technology is not shared, it doesn't really help anybody, because there's a limited number of people I can touch. And hence, to start off with, I'd just like to share what was the reason that I'm here today. I'm a pediatrician. I passed my MD pediatrics from Sion Hospital, uh, Nair Hospital, and I started working as a pediatrician. Typical Sardi Khansi malaria vaccine wala pediatrician. You know what I'm saying? All of you are parents here, you must have taken your child to a pediatrician. The only question when a mother comes into a pediatrician is she asks, How does my child put on more weight? That's the only question the mother probably finds important enough to ask a pediatrician, which is why unfortunately pediatricians also don't know much beyond this. Because that's all that they need to know for a living how to feed your child. But I realized that there were so many children who would come to me and the mothers would say that Mira bacha school jata hai, but he is the terror of the classroom. I am fed up with my child. The teachers just don't know what to do with him. Every day he comes home with a complaint. His calendar gets filled with remarks within the first three months. I have to apply for four calendars in a year. And I hate going for the PTA meeting or the open house. Forget that, I even hate going up to the school to drop him every day. And we did a study with a group of parents from a school in Malad. Utkarsh Mandir was called a Marathi medium school 10 years back. And the mothers were actually domestic helps. And they said, I don't know how many of you follow Marathi, Dr. Ramala Nath is at the gate of the gate, but the last word is that I can understand it, you don't want to go inside because the teacher and the principal will catch you. Why can't you go up to the gate? You know the answer. She says, because the other parents catch me. <laughs> that your child keeps beating our children. Your child is a ruckus in the classroom. A couple of years back, I was involved with the case of a child from a very prominent and a very, very good school. I completely have the highest regard for that school. The child was asked to leave school because the child was diagnosed with another child. And the school insisted that I come there myself to be part of it. So one day I went, I'll just share this with you. When I went, there was a lunch break or a recess. And when I went, the children were all outside the class. So I went and sat at the back of the class. So after the children came and everybody started looking at me, as this person, old man in a tie and stuff, and says, who are you? So I said, I'm a student. So how come you're here? You're so big. So I said, I keep failing all the time. <laughs> so they were all happy. Teacher comes in. There was a lecture or a class or a period of a typical, nice, second standard teacher on prepositions. And I enjoyed myself thoroughly. And she did everything the perfect way that a class should go on probably. Teaching, asking, every child answered, so on and so forth. 
It had been one year since I met this child who had come to my clinic when the case started. When this 35 minute period got over, I had to call the counsellors who had been the observers for a month and ask them, Are, who is the child I am supposed to observe? Who is the child I am, so, I am here to observe and say whether he has autism or not? And then they pointed out one child until that time, I could not recognize the child with autism who is supposed to be calling huge disturbance in the classroom. I, as a so-called expert working only with children with special needs, autism, so on and so forth, could not recognize that child. Ki ye hai jiske liye observe karna hai. And how can I say that yes, this child is causing a ruckus in the classroom? How can I say this child is disturbing other children? How can I say this child is a bad influence on other children? So I said, I don't know whether he has autism or no, but he certainly does not disturb anything. And the point we are trying to make is all of us have a kind of an approach or an attitude towards so many things. And I'm glad we've spoken about everything from religion to social biases to everything. Rishi, it's wonderful. That one minute clip was, that is more important than a 10 hour lecture. So I'm very glad that we could see it. But where is it that all of us who are so well intentioned, every teacher, every principal is well intentioned, why is it that we are not able to get through this? And that's been explained very well in the first session by making your mask, creating your mask, which you did with great love and pleasure and creativity. You thought you'll get marks for it. And then you were told to tear it off and it hurts. And that's what happens to us ever since we grow up. We see a particular way in which our parents raise us, other parents raise others, our teachers teach us. And then we kind of think that is the Bible, the Quran, the Gita or whatever and that's what our mind is made up of. We, the brain works on similarities. Why does the child recognize family and cries when the stranger enters the house at 9 months of age? Is that right? Whom does the child smile first at? At the mother. Whom does the child identify first? Family. What does it mean? The brain, the neurons code for similarity. They code for similarity. That's how the brain builds up. And hence, we find it so difficult to accept Rishi, somebody who is different from us because the brain neurologically thinks that way. And unless we all accept it, it's very difficult to teach our kids. So what are the few things that I'd like to share with you as tips that maybe you could appreciate? The first thing that we need to understand is Swami Vivekanand said, education is the manifestation of knowledge already inherent in man. And a teacher's job is only to uncover and let the child discover the knowledge that is already within himself or herself. So the first thing we have to learn is I am not a teacher or a somebody who brings some knowledge in my pocket and here, take this. I can't do that. I can't give you anything, you can't give me anything, nobody can give anything. So the first thing we have to understand as educators is that we are not, you sit here and you do this and thou shall succeed. There's no commandment like that. It's only being able to f uncover whatever knowledge the child already has. And hence the first thing should be to shift from our methodology. Somebody, Arthi spoke about the British method and I'm glad he said it's still the same thing in Britain as well. The trouble is we are industrialized nations. What does an industrial nation do? What does an industry do? What does an engineer do? The engineer looks at something that I want to take this from here to here. How do I move this from here to here? I do one, two, three, and then this moves from here to here. And then, once I test it on two or three or four times, I mass produce it. Okay, now it can't go wrong. That's how a factory works. And that's exactly how education systems are designed. That 10 children, I taught them this thing, four out of them became doctors, two became engineers, and two failed miserably, I still have a good success rate of 80% great. We've got a great system, let's start with it. And if you look at what happened in India thousands of years back, you had a Gurukul system, where there would be a guru or a teacher, Mr. Malcolm, and there would be students who would just come there. And the guru would then try and find out what each one needed to be told. Please note the fact that there was no annual, not just exams, no annual system. Exam you can do every day also. The exam is not the problem. The time frame is a problem. Ki itne din mein itna seekhna hi chahiye. Varna you are a bad factory worker. Maruti company se aapko nikala jayega. Because every day I need to produce 100 cars. So the example that I would like to give in the Mahabharat, Dronacharya who was probably, we have Dronacharya awards, who is considered the best teacher. So he had 
Yudhishthir, he had Arjun, he had Bhim, and he had Nikul and Shadev. So he had a look at Yudhishthir and said, you will be a jurisprudence guy, like an MBA. So he taught him all about jurisprudence, right and wrong and things like that. He looked at Arjun and said, no, you can't do all this, you are too hot-tempered. You probably are a great archer, you've got good eye-hand coordination. That's how we did developmental pediatricians like me talk. So we'll teach you to become a great archer. Abhim, you have no patience, you have no calmness of mind, you have no eye-hand coordination, your gross motor is good enough, no fine motor. So we'll teach you to become a Gadadhari. And then he taught them those things. And all three of them became experts in their field. But, 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 if Dronacharya had belonged to the SSC system or the ICC system or the CBSE system <laughs> or the IB system, somebody from Delhi or Cambridge or from Mumbai or Pune would have sent him a curriculum ki look, this is what you're supposed to teach all your students this year. So this year's portion is only archery. This year's syllabus is only archery and teach all of them archery. Arjun still, this is why we get trapped. Arjun still would have been the world's best archer, but Yudhishthir and Bhim would have been so frustrated, probably they would have tried to commit suicide. <laughs> and then you would have set up some inquiry commission, why are children committing suicide? Let's bring in RTE, no examinations. Doesn't help. What was needed to be done is find out that this bloke is good at gross motor, let's teach him to use a mace. This bloke is good at calmness and thinking, let's teach him to be a judge. This guy is a shooter, let's make him into one. We have a football team. Uh, let's talk about cricket. Somebody, you know, immediately Sajid Tendulkar this morning. What does a coach do? Kids come to a coach. He takes a look at them. And does he just tell them, you're going to be my opening batsman, you're going to be the opening batsman, you're going to be opening batsman. All of you are opening batsmen. It's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Then he can't just say, Hina, Mina, Mina, Mo, batsman, bowler, wicket keeper, batsman, bowler. He can't do that either. So what does he do? He lets them play. He says, come on, pick up, bad ball, whatever, let's play for a couple of days. Let me observe. Then he says, either to bad short, then to ball delay. You are a bowler. Is that for me? <laughs> School system, lecture, time period, deliver. You don't, you don't play around with the bat or the ball. You are good at neither. You go stand behind the stumps. You are a wicket keeper. You are good at catching stuff. And then, there is a different way he teaches everybody. He teaches a bowler differently, he teaches a batsman differently, and he teaches different bowlers differently. Why is that? Because all bowlers are not, are all not fast bowlers. Some are spin bowlers, some are off spin, some are leg spin. Some batsmen are opening batsmen, some batsmen are middle order batsmen. What does it mean? It means that he recognizes that there is different skill set in everybody. So I will train them to play that function to produce that function. But you know why he can do it and why we can't do it in school? Because we all know that in cricket we have to have 11 differently abled, differently gifted, differently endowed people. We don't understand that in the classroom. We say no. All of you have to be good at math, French, English, Marathi, Hindi grammar, Vyakran and everything else. You have to be. You have to be. So this is the point that I'm trying to say is that the challenge here is how do we recognize children as individuals? We cannot recognize them in secondary section or in primary. And my big plea to all the principals here is how many of you walk into your pre-primary class? Because if you want to do all these great things that the great people spoke here today about being agents or ambassadors for changing the nation, which you are appropriately placed to be, you have to get into the engine room which is not the class 10th where you will be laughed off, you turn around and somebody puts a chalk on your head, which what 10th standard kids will do. You need to get into the pre-primary. That is the engine room of the nation. If you want the nation start 25 years earlier in the engine room, which is a pre-primary. So recognize each child for what he's able to do. Like he showed us in the film, let him run around. See what each child is wanting to do. Then. Make a note on a piece of paper, not in your mind, because you may be transferred next year. And you may not be the next year's teacher. Write it down and keep a document that I think this kid is good at this. Let next year's teacher read it. Let this child be then tracked through every year. What did he come here as? And ask yourself, what are we trying to make him into? So it's not the Britishers who are responsible for making people clerks. It is we who are responsible for continuing it. Why? 
because it's easier to make people into clerks it's difficult to make people into an artist into a painter into a doctor into an engineer depending on what he wants to do and which is why theater is the most important thing because theater does not yet in india have a school curriculum grab it grab it take that as your method to get into the system to change the system let there be theater let there be creative activities let the kids come up doing what they want but observe them very carefully you need to track them across the years be very careful to know uh, something i was discussing with mrs vijaya we have all these so called experts today and counselors and tom after tare zameen par tom dick harry and their aunties all became counselors nobody asks what is your qualification what qualified you and more importantly what exactly are you qualified to do i may be a doctor but i am cannot deliver a woman i am not a gynecologist i cannot do cancer surgery my skills are limited to something particularly so when you refer children make very sure one that you find out what is my child's problem why am i referring him what do i need fix that's one two the person i am referring to does he have the skill sets and the qualifications to serve that purpose to me three ask that person to write back to you at new horizons every child is evaluated not just by me a doctor doesn't matter it's a team of people so we have occupational therapists we have physiotherapists we have psychologists we have special educators because it's like building or constructing a building a plumber is also needed electrician is also needed because both do different things in the building but if the plumber and the electrician don't talk to each other and to the civil engineer they'll probably make the shower on top of the bed in the toilet because they don't know what the other person is doing so it's very important to document whatever all these people are doing and today 10 years after tarism I mean, for same complaints we have scores and scores of institutions we have scores and scores of educators and psychologists but we are not able to solve the purpose because no one person can solve a child's problem do you have only one teacher teaching everything from history to math to language no everybody has different skills similarly if you refer a child please understand all of us want to call a child as dyslexia learning problem educational problem please understand 50% of children with ld dyslexia 50% of children also have ADHD attention deficit hyperactivity disorder a remedial educator is taught how to work on the educational problems of a child with dyslexia an occupational therapist is taught how to work with the hyperactivity or the behavioral skills of an ADHD unless both of them are put together and a doctor is in charge of it and knows what is being done you are not going to get good results what happens is that 10 years back we didn't know what these children had so we ignored them now we know what they have we label them yet nothing has changed with them so what we need to have is a shift looking at children individually what are the children skills how are our own staff teachers and people in the school dealing with those children and if we need external help is it professional help i'd like to end by saying that recently at new horizons we have 65 people so of course you run into a lot of problem so we hired recently an hr consultant to deal with all our therapists all our team members so the first mail she said i said here is a new hr human resource consultant she said sorry i am not a human resource consultant let's not call your team members human resource let's call them human capital let's call them human capital because when you call them capital look at what happens to their the caller type look i am capital i can do something so my last plea to all of you today is if we want this great country with this huge population great diversity where nobody agrees with anybody else to come up we cannot change the school system unless we change our approach towards children children are not receivers of knowledge but children are the biggest resource in your school you have one classroom filled of 30 children half of some of which speak marathi some of speak gujarati some of speak uh, some of them may speak uh, telugu some of them may speak bengali which teacher in your school knows all these languages why are you sending one teacher who doesn't know how these languages to teach those kids let's find out what those th- kids can do for the rest of the school they are masters at that language already when you look at a group of 60 kids don't look at a 60 kids now dr dalwai will tell me how to manage them rubbish i can't tell you how to manage them find out how those 60 kids can contribute to you to each other to the school to the environment unfortunately when i went to school the only activity we could contribute was rsp and boy scouts but after school all stood in the queue and you know used those whistles and looked around at boys and girls and had some fun why can't we get every child to be involved 
in being a resource, he is the person, the wealth of the school, the child, the girl is the wealth of the school. How can we get them to be empowered so that we can sit back? If there are children with ADHD in the classroom, I'm sure we can find some job for them to do. I'm sure if there are children who are shy in the school, we can get somebody else not so shy, but at the same age, height and voice tone to go and talk to them and get them to be involved, rather than me going and saying, there's no point being shy. So what I'm suggesting is all of us need to get down to this approach where we involve people like Parisar Asha, where we involve differently able children, where we involve different activities in the classroom and try and break barriers in our own minds first before we break to others. And I'd like to end with New Rises quote which says that every child can do better compared to yesterday, not compared to the other child. So every child can do better only if you adopt an approach called from label to anyone.